be able to get this on live stream. Also, our news program. Uh, Sister Lisa Tesh, who works with us, asked me, she said, you talked about doing something new on the news the other night, but she didn't say what it was. Uh, what we're trying to do, what we're intending to do here very soon, is actually running our newscast live on live stream. It'll be different than what you're seeing right now on uh, the Shabbat live program, mainly because uh, I think we have everything we need to do now in order to be able to run news live to where you can actually see it through the exact same camera that we use on YouTube. Uh, so that's really what I've been uh, trying to do. And then also, um, you know, how do you actually do that and make it look good? So anyhow, uh, let me have you, I need to really open up a different screen here as well. Um, and so just bear with me real quick here. But um, like I said, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to 2 Chronicles. Um, I got that one just right. Uh, sorry, guys, I have to. All right. Okay. Anyway, so if you have your Bibles with you, Shabbat Shalom to you, and we will turn to Second Chronicles. Uh, I am. Pardon me here, just a moment here. I am oh, still getting in the wrong area. There, there's a lot that I wanted to do on this particular message here. And uh, so we, we're still dealing with a lot of issues here in the eastern part of the world, uh, trying to get things settled, so it's been very hectic for us. Um, hectic get thing, <clears throat> getting things in, in, in place as well, and I am looking at such a tiny screen, it makes it very difficult here too. Um, all right, we're 21, and I believe we are gonna be going to the seventh verse. Yes, the seventh verse there. <clears throat> okay. In Chronicles chapter 21, the second Chronicles that is, chapter 21 verse 7 is what I want to draw your attention to where God says here, uh, and, and by the way, just a quick uh, overview of what, what this is going about. Uh, Jehoshaphat has died. His son, Jeroboam, reigns in uh, his place. And after uh, Jehoshaphat's death, um, Jer uh, Jeroboam, uh, uh, Jehoshaphat's son Jeroboam, he is just becomes a very, very wicked king. Je Jehoram, excuse me, not Jeroboam, Jehoram. And uh, he kills all of his brother with, brothers with a sword. He is just a merciless, ruthless ruler. Um, but yet, oddly enough, God does not destroy the man, um, nor the kingdom of Israel, regardless of his sins. It was kind of, kind of ironic in itself because Jehoshaphat was such a godly king and he really brought Israel to one mind, one heart, and one accord. And then we find suddenly that this young man is just as wicked as can be. Verse 7, though, God says here, Howbeit the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David, as he promised to give a light to him to his sons forever. Now, there's probably already commentators probably done spoke about this. They've probably done, gone into this very deeply. Uh, but I wanted to take you into it myself. And because that light, you, let, me, let me say it like this here, especially for the sake of the Jewish people that might listen to this message, we have to ask ourselves a question. Does God lie? Is God able to keep his word, or does he break his promise? Think about it. <clears throat> because God clearly says here in 2 Chronicles, he would not destroy 
the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David and as he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. Hmm. In 70 AD, the temple is destroyed. The house of Judah, which is also the house of David, uh, up until that time, we would literally, if you're Jewish and you believe the Bible for what it says, we believe the Tanakh, the, the Torah, uh, to be exactly the inspired word of God, we would have to conclude then, uh, unless we were to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, we would have to conclude then that God did not keep his word. Now, there's some that would probably argue to say, no, even though that uh, the house of David went into exile, uh, it, they still had a light unto them. No, that is not correct. It, clearly by the verse, in verse 7, he says, Howbeit the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And, and as the promise, promise to give a light to him and to his sons forever. So my question is to my Jewish brethren, did God keep his word or did God break his word? And when God talks about destroying, this, this is exile. This is uh, wiping out descendants, etc. Um, so I know there's many rabbis who would probably argue and say, no, we have returned to our homeland, so there's still a light under the house of David. But I differ with you on that. And I would have to bring you then and, and, and challenge my Jewish brethren on this very subject based on the word that is used here. Now, the word in Hebrew that is used here is not the word or, which is what we typically use for the word light that you find in Genesis when God said, uh, and let there be light, the or, okay? Uh, that's what God says in Genesis. But in this case here, the word is nia. Nun ye yodresh is how you spell nia. Now, just to share with you here. So he says, velo ava Adonai, um, boy, I can't even really see it. Lacha shechit et bait David lamaan chaberit, which is the covenant that he's made there. Asha karat la David that he's made this covenant with David. Asha Omar latata to give uh, to him lo excuse me latata lo near to give uh, unto him a light. Uh, uh, to his sons all the days of all, all their days. Now, this is a promise in which God has made to the house of David that he would actually give them a light. Now, the word nia here, it's a very interesting word in Hebrew. It is actually a homonym. Now, some people would think that Hebrew is such a perfect language, and it, I agree, it is a very perfect language, and this is why God chose to use this language to bring his Torah with. But it's a homonym, and rightly so. The word here, near, has two different meanings. Uh, those of you that follow your strong concordance for the Christian people, you will find that the, that the meanings in there, that it is uh, it can be a lamp or the light or the brightness of a lamp. So it is a light, but it is light that is contained in a vessel. All right? Now, another way that this word is also used in the Hebrew language is to break up a ground. Uh, it is like to plow, or but it's to break that ground up, which to me is perfect. Because the homonym there was there for a reason, and God put his word together so beautifully that in both cases, it's perfect. There, there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. It should be a homonym. It should have a dual meaning because actually what it's speaking of, in order for you to receive the light that David is promised, you would have to break up the ground. And if you don't break up the ground, you'll never receive the light that was promised unto David. All right, let's take some look, look, look at some of the different scriptures that, that apply to this. Um, and you'll see exactly what I'm speaking about. I'd like first to take you to the Christian text. It's kind of interesting. Yeshua makes a very interesting statement here. It's one that perhaps uh, Christians have never really associated with uh, this particular verse as promise, but it is a verse that applies. It's in uh, chapter 13 of Matthew, 
In Matthew's Gospel, and he says in verse 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed unto the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, and some sixty, and some thirty. Okay? So here... In this case here, Yeshua is talking about the ground receiving seed. Now, the only way a good ground can receive seed, the ground has to be broken up. It has to be plowed. It has to be near. It has to be near. You have to near that ground, plow that ground, in order for the seed to go into the ground, correct? And we know that what is he talking about? The seed is the word of life. Is that right? It's the word of life. Now, let's also take, and let's go to... Uh, St. John's Gospel, and we will go into the first verse, or chapter 1, excuse me, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Another interesting thought there. The life was light. Now Jesus says that the seed that falls, the ground has to be broken up. He doesn't say the word broken up in this case here, but he's speaking of a ground that is prepared for the receiving of the seed. Correct? All right, now, let's take another look at another uh, passage here. I want to take you to Jeremiah. Uh, and in Jeremiah... We're going to go to chapter 4. And I'm going to read to you verse 3 and 4. So he says here, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Imagine the hat. Here Jeremiah is prophesying, about exactly what Yeshua would be speaking about in the future. Where he says, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, not to the children of Israel, but to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, the house of David. Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. By the way, that is the word nia in Hebrew used in that verse. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like a fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Mm. There's another scripture that speaks about the tares and the wheat and how that the, it says that the, the weeds were to be gathered together and bound because they'd be burned and the wheat would be gathered into his garner. For the harvesting. Exactly, okay? So now, we, we see here now, the word nia in Hebrew is used here, breaking up the ground, and so not among thorns. Jesus says over here in Matthew, he also received seed among the thorns, as he that heareth the word and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. See, Jesus was already, here, here Jeremiah is forewarning you, or what will happen if you end up getting it in thorns? And Jesus tells you as well what will happen. You'll receive it gladly, but the cares of the world will choke you out. All right. Now, again in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, we find the same thing. Again, the word uh, for nia is being used to break up the ground. All right. But in this case, though, I want to take you to another passage over in the book of Exodus. And I want you to see one of the original places that the word nia is used. It's in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. 
in the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever and to their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. Hmm. By the way, when the word Nia is used here and also in other places, it is used every time when it's representing the menorah, the light that the menorah would give off. In Zechariah, it speaks about how that the, um, um, and I don't have that marked right offhand here, but Zechariah speaks about the golden lampstand and the two olive branches on either side of the golden lampstand. You see, Christ is the light of the world. He is in Genesis, where Genesis says, um, let me take you back to that real quick here. Yeshua is Genesis chapter 1, where he says, um, Elohim yahi or ve yahi or. In the, see, and God says, not just let there be, eternity coming into existence as a light. But the problem was, he became that light, God manifested himself as a light to have fellowship with his creation, Adam and Eve, and he put that light within them. John says that the, that the light, or that the word was the light of men. In other words, the Spirit of God came inside Adam and in Eve as well, and they were filled with the Spirit of God, the fire of God, and this is why they're called Ish and Isha. Both their names have the word fire in there, Aish. And both their names contain the first two letters for the divine name of God, the Yod and the He, meaning Yah, or God. And they are filled with the light of God. The power of the Holy Spirit himself dwelling inside of them. When God says, He says he would breathe in his nostrils the breath of life. Talking about that clay figure, it was in the plural form that the life of God was breathed into that human body. Why a plural form? Because Eve is inside the body with him. But when sin came into the world, the light was forsaken. That light, God's light, was forsaken. And so therefore the man lost that access to the tree of life, the way to the tree of life. And God, immediately seeing his creation in the condition that it was, went to work to redeem back his creation. And the only way to re redeem it back was God had to take the light that was once dwelling among them. And God had to put that light into a vessel. And the awe become near. No, nun yod reish. Near. That's why we see in Exodus and other places in the Torah that the seven golden lampstand is represented as the light that burns from it is the Nia. It is the glistening light. The awe, the light that was in the beginning that gave life unto men, now it just become a glowing flame in the life of Israel. And it was there set before them as a, as a, as a, a symbolic gesture that God's life was with them. And so the scripture says in another verse there, as I saw it said to you before, it also meant to break up the ground. We say in English, follow the ground, break up the ground. The word follow is the word near, it's to break it up. Because the only way you can receive the life of God inside of you, Jew or Gentile, your heart must be broken up. It must be prepared to receive the life of Almighty God. And so my Jewish brethren, I ask you the question then, did God keep his promise to David? Because he swore to David that he would always have a light unto his sons forever. He would not destroy the kingdom because of the evil kings that came along over the house of Judah, such as Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram. 
because of his promise. You see, God knew that the Nia, that light in a vessel was coming. And he knew that that light also would be the one that had the ability to break up the ground. The same vessel that held the light was the same vessel that come and broke up the ground, broke up the hearts of the men of Judah, the sons of David at that time, 2,000 years ago. And as he began to break up their hearts and their hearts became soft, they were able to receive it. But unfortunately, some of them, they received it gladly, but they were among thorns. And the cares of the world choked it out perhaps popularity, perhaps need of physical things. I'm not sure really what all it was that caused the problem. But it began to choke it out, and this was the problem there. But the, it, it, is, it is absolutely amazing to me to see every, everywhere we look. He is that light. He is the golden lampstand. He is the one... As the Bible says, they're the two anointed ones that were on either side of the golden lampstand. He is the one that will give them life in order to be able to bring that light to Israel. And so everywhere, as I begin to look in the word of God, in the book of Matthew, Yeshua fulfilling the very prophecies that were written there. Also, and Jeremiah, for thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Jeremiah prophesied, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart, you men of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So in order for God to fulfill his promise to David, in order for God to fulfill it, there had to come a vessel. We know according to Zechariah's prophecy, clearly, that um, in, in, let me see, I think, I think he called, uh, let's see, golden, I think it's called the golden candlesticks in Zechariah. In, in, in the book of Revelation, we also have, and I turned to see the voice of the, he spake to me, and being turned, I saw, I saw seven golden candlesticks, Revelation 1, 12. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and a girt and paps with a, with a golden girdle. See? Now, later down in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, uh, we see that Yeshua himself speaks here. John records it. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and in the seven golden can uh, candlesticks, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. You see, so that light, that near, that vessel was to go down. It was to go down through all the ages there. And that's exactly, uh, that's exactly what Yeshua did. In Zechariah, it's in chapter four, uh, verse eight, I'll begin. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to, unto me saying, the hands of Zer Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. And thou, thou <clears throat> shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zer Zerubbabel with, these, with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through all the earth. Then answer I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees up, up uh, upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which uh, through the golden, the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? 
And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You know, <laughs> that's another one that gets me right there. You know, sometimes we, people talk about the two witnesses and it's even been used here in Zechariah to use that to try to support Enoch and, uh, and Elijah as being the two witnesses. But it's funny, Zechariah tells you exactly, he gives you the identifying mark to know who the two witnesses are. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Who's the Lord of the whole earth? It's Yeshua, right? So on Mount Transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah was on either side of Yeshua, was he not the Lord of the whole earth? And who were the two anointed ones that stood on either side of him? Okay. So there you go. Go figure that one, right? All right. So the, let, me, let me back up just a little bit further, though, here. Um, and the angel talked with me. Verse 4, four chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> As a man that is awakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I, I looked, and behold a candlestick of, of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake uh, to the angel that talked with me saying, what are these my Lord? Then the angel talked with me and answered and said to me, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and spake to me saying, the word of the Lord desirable will not be my, or, okay, we already read that part there. But anyway, the whole point is, is it's a light again. It is a light in a vessel. And the one that is that lampstand is Yeshua, as we see in Revelation chapter 1. It was Christ all along. All along was him. So he is that light. He is that Nia. He is also the one that broke up the ground. So when David, when we ask ourselves the question as Jews, did God keep his word to David when he promised that there would always be a light into the house of David and to his sons? Yes, he did. When Yeshua come, who was a descendant of David, because Joseph, his adopted father, and by the way, the adoption is much greater than the natural birth as far as a parent, but through his adopted father, he was a descendant of David. Even his biological mother, he was a descendant of David as well through her own genealogy. So we clearly see in the scripture that David had a light. And that light finally was the true Nia. He was that lamp. He was the very lamp that God had prophesied of. Yeshua was that light. The light that was in the very beginning in Genesis, when God said, Be'yomer Elohim, Yahior, that light became manifest in a vessel, in a golden lampstand. It's the same light that God said, he tells to the prophet Jeremiah, break up your hearts. Break up the ground of your heart so that you can receive it. Did not the prophet say that the Children of Israel were stiff-necked. This is the house of Judah. Stiff-necked, uncircumcised with ears. Hard-hearted. But the thing is, all you had to do is break up your heart. Nia, your heart. In other words, let the vessel that had the light break up your heart as well. Even today, if you don't understand, if you don't know Yeshua, if you've been too hard-hearted, let the same vessel that can fill you with his light break up your heart so that you can receive that light into your own heart. And by the way, he was the vessel. He also gave light to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Those churches have been typed out through every age. We've seen lukewarm believers in every age. In other words, we see Laodicea in every age. It was there in the time when Yeshua was here, or excuse me, when Paul spoke about it. It's in today's church as well. Anyway, I trust this has been a blessing to you today. And God bless you, those of you that were able to be here with us on Shabbat Live. Um, 
pray for us. We do need your prayers. And we thank you and God bless you. We love you guys tremendously. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom from the eastern part of the world.